Hello? Hello? Hello. This is my first public speaking not at Burning Man, so... <laughs> it's weird that none of you are wearing leather underwear. <laughs> no, no, it is weird. I am... Uh, no, not. Not <laughs> Correction, it's weird none of you are wearing visible <laughs> leather underwear. And, uh, before starting, I wanted to thank everyone for being here. The, all the people who are, who are organizing the event, but also... You know, just everybody for listening and participating. I think it's awesome. Uh, I want to thank this tree. I find its energy to be fantastic, and I think it kind of uh, serves as a nexus of all of us to speak and to listen. Uh, so, I'm a social worker. I work for the county of Los Angeles. I work in the busiest mental health clinic. So I work for the Department of Mental Health. Uh, it's called Downtown Mental Health. It's in Skid Row on Maple and Fifth. I've been there almost a year. Before that, I was uh, in what's called an FSP. It's people who are solo functioning. They don't, oh, that is my friendly face. You weren't lying. Um, it's for people who are solo functioning that you know, they don't just really go to a clinic. So the social worker goes out to them and uh, you, know, you take them to the bank or the library or you just hang out with them. Before that, I worked in a mental health jail, Twin Towers. That was the best experience. I highly recommend working in mental health jails. It, uh, there's a lot of God there. Um, so I wanted to start, I'm going to try this without my notes, which means I'll probably leave out some good stuff. I wanted to start with the Skid Row and how it got to be the way it is. Uh, history of Los Angeles and Skid Row. So first of all, what is Skid Row? It's a shitty neighborhood. Uh, it's bound very specifically, actually, exactly, uh, 3rd Street, 7th Street, on the north and south parameters in downtown LA. Uh, to the west, it used to be Los Angeles, now it's Maine, one block over, and to the east, Alameda. I don't know exactly how big that is, but it's, it's, I feel like it's about a mile by maybe a mile and a half or two. Population is, well, you know, it's very hard to census any area, but that's the hardest of all. Roughly 10,000. 5,000 live in very tiny rooms. Another 2,500 are sleeping in shelters, so they're homeless, but with shelter, another 2,500 on the streets. Uh, so how did Skid Row get to be this way? Uh, when the railroad got to Los Angeles, it terminated pretty close to where Skid Row is. There was a lot of agriculture in what is now East Los Angeles, so you had a lot of single males coming in for seasonal work, which meant that uh, you had a lot of single resident occupancy hotel rooms that were maybe about as big as the dusty patch here, you know, in, in between me and the front row. And uh, they were coming in, making a little bit of money and leaving, and that created a lot of prostitution, drugs, drinking, unemployment. Hindsight is 2020, but if you were going back to the 1870s and you kind of wondered where the skid row of Los Angeles would show up, it would show up near where the railroad tracks end. It's a little bit like how a lot of docks in uh, port cities end up having lousy neighborhoods. I've lived in LA, Frisco, New York, and Chicago. There's nothing like skid row in any of the others. Um, so the rooms get built and uh, about a hundred years, oh, Industrial Revolution only exacerbated everything I talked about because now you have full-time industry in East LA, which is still largely like that, a lot of factories and whatnot. And uh, you have even more people coming in through the railroads, more goods, and uh, more lack of stability. By the 50s, you have a lot of buildings that are about 80 years old, and the city realizes you have this whole huge area generating very little income, a lot of crime, and the buildings are all bad, so they demolished a bunch of them, so homelessness went up. And then in the 60s, you have the Vietnam War and the drug culture, and homelessness really skyrocketed. You have the 70s and Nixon, things got worse with housing. And then with Reagan in the 80s, you had two things going on. One, huge cuts in social spending, and the other is this thing called deinstitutionalization, when they started cutting funding to uh, what you would call uh, mental hospitals, and people were put on the streets, thus creating the clusterfuck that is Skid Row. And I'm not cursing to... Uh, be informal, I'm cursing to emphasize what I really think of the situation. Not the people, but the policies that have created it. So one thing I want to stress, and this is my opinion, but uh, Skid Row is not a malfunction, it's a function. It's not a policy failure, it's a policy success. I think Skid Row is being created and maintained uh, extremely well. And uh, I think the policies that uh, have put it in place have been very effective, and uh, you know they spend a lot of money to keep it just the way it is. So... I just want to make sure. Ah, yes. So I wanted to talk to you about uh, just a few statistics, just to keep things a little bit clear. Uh, I did the history. Uh, LA County is pretty big, as we all know. 3% uh, of the county's homelessness is in Skid Row, which doesn't sound like that much. 
but uh, Skid Row only has one ten thousandth of a percent of the land of the county. So, proportionally speaking, Skid Row is, has 30,000 times as much poverty concentrated and chronic homelessness concentrated as any comparable area. And there's nothing like it. Um, it's the most policed neighborhood in the country. And based on some research that I got to do with some other shelters, it's the most policed neighborhood in the world outside of Iraq. And Iraq is only policed that heavily because of other American tax dollars. Um, half the people there that are homeless are what's called chronically homeless, meaning they've been homeless for over a year, and or they carry a mental illness, and or they carry a drug addiction, which I will be talking about. The recent increase in the last 10 or 15 years in Skid Row, you see women and children. There are families there. Lots of theories about why that is. The, big, the best theory I've heard on that is that in 30 years ago, when women were getting beaten at home, they got beaten at home. Nowadays, some of the women who are suffering domestic violence say enough's enough and they leave, which is good. The kids tend to go with them, which is probably good. And now you have a lot of women and children who are homeless in Skid Row, which is not good. Is there anything else I needed to say that I didn't memorize? Um, yes, there is. Um, I wanted to just uh, throw out just a few more stats, uh, just to put in perspective where some money is going, which I'll be touching on later. Um, so recently, not that recently, even a couple years ago, Vieira Gosa did this uh, SCI, the Safer City Initiative, which meant I'm going to put a lot of money into a lot of cops into Skid Row, and this will prove I'm good. They spent so even just recently, um, they added another 50 cops to Skid Row because you know God knows they need more cops there, and that costs about six million dollars a year, not from the county but the city budget. So proportionally, that's a lot higher. This is an interesting statistic because the city is spending uh, on low-income housing for homeless people $5.7 million. And the, a lot of people are pissed off about that. And in Mayday and Skid Row and Purging Square and everywhere, I was seeing all kinds of signs about this. Um, that's about the gist for that. Uh, one thing I wanted to consider is a, a little social theory. I was a philosophy major in college. I read Max Weber, the father of sociology. Max Weber says in The Politics of Vocation, and it's one of the deepest statements I've ever heard, he says uh, power, uh, happiness, all these things that people are trying for, they're conserved quantities. And what that means is if you're in a society, there's only so much happiness to go around, just like there's so many dollars or pineapples or avocado trees to go around. So if there are some people who have lots and lots and lots of power and lots and lots of happiness, there's someone else who has very little. So it's not just about dollars, right? It's not just about if there's somebody rich in Beverly Hills, there's gonna be 100 poor people in Skid Row or wherever. If there's someone very happy who has all their dreams fulfilled in a zero-sum society, there's gonna be a lot of people without. Uh, this floored me when I read this, I think when I was 18, and it continues to floor me to this day. Um, Skid Row, how do you get there? Nobody knows, because almost no one is born there. Most common demographic for Skid Row is an African-American male, probably from South LA. Uh, there are three primary paths, and they overlap significantly, so I'm not speaking of them as discrete entities, but kind of like a, kind of like a Venn diagram, but with three circles. <laughs> Back to the microphone. Uh, the three circles are poverty, which you can interpret not just as lack of money, but lack of lots of things, uh, mental health issues, and drug addiction. My clinic is technically speaking for the mentally ill, but uh, if you're doing this in Skid Row, there's no way you separate, there's no way you separate uh, mental health from poverty and from drug addiction. They're called co-occurring disorders. If your uh, diagnosis is, you know, for example, maybe you're bipolar, so uh, maybe you're self-medicating, you're drinking when you're manic, you're smoking crack or snorting crystal meth when you're depressed. It's called a co-occurring disorder, dual diagnosis, comorbidity. Uh, another path, as we said, is poverty. And what we're seeing now that there's research is there's multi-generational poverty. Um, something to consider is a lot of people think, you know, ah, well, you know, I chose to go to college. Ah, he must have chosen to be a bum. And one thing that I, correct, he's shaking is that's the right answer. One thing that I used to say a lot, particularly when I was working in Twin Towers in the mental health jail is if I would say to a certain patient of mine, you know, if, if you switched us at birth, I'd probably, you know, and I'd grown up in your neighborhood, I, I would be the inmate and, and you would be my social. So you think, you know, I, I, you know, I chose to go to college, I chose to go to social work school, I chose this, I chose that. I mean, I didn't choose the freckles on my arms. And I think it's not as separate as, as one would think. I mean, for me, me going to college was probably guaranteed around the time I was in the womb. Not really, I mean, you know, not a wealthy white kid, but lots of books in the home, I was not abused. 
one of my parents had uh, a college education, um, grew up in a first world nation, relatively low crime rate, I'm going to college. You know, and if I, instead of growing up in North Hollywood, I grew up in Compton, and I'm not trying to stereotype, I'm trying to uh, declare a, a, a kind of sociological pattern, you know, uh, a, a lack of a two-family household, and I'm not saying that's the only way, I'm saying these are things that facilitate, uh, you know, the clear and easy road. Perhaps uh, you don't know many adults who have health insurance or college degrees, uh, violence, crime, and so on. Your high school rate is, uh, graduation rate is pretty low. It's gonna be a lot harder to go to college, a lot harder. Uh, so that's another factor to consider. It's not that people sort of grow up and say, I want to be poor, I want to be rich, as much as society kind of nudges you along to the point when you're 18, all of a sudden society is conspiring to get you to be poor or rich. Um, I have I have a caseload of about 200 patients. My, my Can I do this without? Would this be okay? I, all right, I would feel a little better. If you can't hear, please let me know. I, I'm feeling a little Pink floyd up here. Um, that's better. You have a great voice, by the way. Why, thank you. <laughs> so a couple of patients. So just to give an, a perspective of what people are dealing with and how they end up in Skid Row, one of my most interesting patients, uh, woman, mother, former drug addict. She had a father. The father was sexually, physically, and emotionally abusing herself, several siblings, and the mom when she was young and still prepubescent. One day she picked up a golf club and beat the shit out of her father to defend her family. And when the father came to and became conscious, she kicked him out of the house. Uh, and this was the way that she stopped the kind of abuse that had to go on. Now, this is probably the most optimistic story I can say to begin with. But of course, she ended up uh, having some severe drug addictions in her life that didn't end until she almost died in a car accident. And it was the car accident that uh, got her to kind of see what was going on in her life because she was in a coma, had to learn to walk and talk again, and so on. Uh, it's sometimes these extremes of what I would call karma and what I talk a lot about with my patients because some of my job is psychotherapy and some of it is case management. So psychotherapy is not just, you know, tell me about your father, but actually I'm trying to work <laughs> out, you know, what, what's going on with your life, what are you heading towards? Why do you think you go back to drugs? Why do you think you're not going back to drugs? Now that you're not doing drugs, you get to deal with all the reasons you went into drugs to begin with, which is sort of the most interesting part of therapy in that neighborhood for me. Uh, and case management is more like trying to help people get housing, uh, linking them up to Alcoholics Anonymous, getting them a bus pass, getting them a free phone so they can make calls and whatever else. Um, so there's that. Um, I would say that for the most part, it's people who are struggling on an existential level. I think that Skid Row has really, really um, created not just a sense of what it is to be poor, but what it is to sort of face your reality. One of my patients went from being I'm not saying this like the therapist who cured people. I did not cure him by any standards. But I'm saying over the course of his treatment, he started out being pretty suicidal. Now he describes himself as having some level of serenity. Uh, when I asked him how he feels he achieved this, he said, well, me ending up here was what I needed to face the things I needed to face in myself. So like I said, there's a lot of karma involved here. Uh, but I'm going to try and uh, at least stick a little bit more to Skid Row and not my patients, because I know for a fact it's kind of like kids, like you can talk about your children forever. So I know I could talk about my patients for a long time. Um, I think people get the idea that uh, if you're mentally ill, if you're schizophrenic, for example, uh, you're either going to be taking legitimate medications like Risperidone or Seroquel, or you're going to have some illegitimate drug addiction or both. Uh, there's something like an 80 to 85 percent or whatever the rate is of co-occurring disorders with severe mental illnesses and drugs or alcohol. Uh, that's just reality. If you're schizophrenic, you also have higher possibilities for things like diabetes, by, uh, uh, severe depression, and so on. If you're schizophrenic, your life uh, expectancy is about 25 years less than it would be otherwise. And a lot of this has to do with how we treat people who are schizophrenic. Um, so it's not just I hear voices, it's not just my reality is different than yours, it's I'm dying. It's the reason that I can't have a relationship, it's the reason I don't have a house, it's the reason that I don't relate to people. This is a severe issue. Another severe issue, if you think about it, is if you're born into poverty, you're more likely to experience severe trauma, more likely to be sexually molested, which is everywhere in my job. And that's gonna help create psychosis. Now, psychosis does not mean you're psychotic and you're an ax murderer. Psychosis means auditory or uh, visual or tactile hallucinations. Something very interesting that floored me that I learned in school, uh, a lot of the, every single soldier that was caught in no man's land in World War I, because back then that was the trench warfare. They'd have a trench here, 
and a trench here, and then for a mile or so, there was what was called no man's land, right? So some people got caught in the middle, and they would dive into a, like a pit that was created by a shell, and they would just stay there and wait for the uh, artillery to stop for, you know, and that would take about eight hours. So they're sitting there, and stuff is blowing up around them, and they can't move, and you can't do anything. It creates the most <laughs> severe anxiety you can imagine. Every single soldier who dealt with this for several hours and survived and came back reported hallucinations. So what I want to emphasize is that a lot of my schizophrenic patients have mental illness and it's genetic, but it's really epigenetic, which is to say the interaction between your genetics and your environment. So everybody here is capable of being schizophrenic, and I don't just mean for that moment. When you have that kind of severe PTSD, you're going to carry on your psychosis. Not forever and not no matter what, but it's something that you'll carry with you. So another thing is schizophrenia and skid row, it's not for the them, the those, it's for us. And if you switch birth with people there, they're going to be sitting under the avocado tree listening about skid row and you're going to be over there living skid row. And that's the great equalizer. You know, like, like Hamlet, he's holding that skull, old Yorick, I knew him, right? He was funny, now he's dead. Death is the great equalizer. I think humanity is the great equalizer. And one of the reasons that I love my job and one of the reasons, not good at it in the sense that I'm better than another social worker, but better, I think, than at least some of the kind of burnout county workers that fulfills a kind of stereotype that I know that one of the reasons I'm better at connecting with the people I work with is I'm not better than them. You know, I, I might, I mean, I, I have more money. I have better health insurance if they have any at all. My posture is better because I've never slept on a sidewalk and so on and so on and so on. But I'm not better than them. My soul is not cut from a different cloth. Some of my patients are molesters. I'm sure that, I mean, I'm not saying that it's okay to molest. I'm saying that every single one of my patients who have molested were molested as children. Not everybody who was molested became a molester, but what I'm saying is no matter what people are bringing to the plate, whether it's drug addiction, suicide attempt, psychosis, sexual abuse as a victim, sexual abuse as a perpetrator or both, we're all cut from the same cloth. And if you go through a severe enough trauma in life, you're capable of being pushed in certain directions. Every, you now people can choose, a lot of people, we have a few, not many, but over the last 10 years, I think two or three people have gotten, who have been patients at my clinic, not my patients, but others, ended up like getting out of Skid Row, going on to get like a PhD, one is I think got a PhD in literature from Arizona, University of Arizona, another one is getting a PhD out of Yale, but that's certainly the exception to the rule. Uh, for, for most, what we're trying to do is create a better quality of life and uh, a more humane sense of connection with others and a sense of compassion. Um, I think I, w I went off my topic a bit, but I think I said some important things. So uh, I think I talked a little bit about how you end up in Skid Row. You're either poor, uh, you're mentally ill, or you have a drug addiction, and these will overlap, and this is what I would call epigenetics. Uh, how do you get out of Skid Row? Um, well, social services, housing helps. Low-income housing is a big deal. Um, getting meds helps if that is what is necessary for you. Not everybody needs them, but some do. Uh, Fiscal help, you know, whether you're on general relief or really already, 10, okay, or some kind of social security and therapy. Uh, the fact is, if you're mentally ill, you're going to end up with better chances for getting housing, for getting services, and I have mixed feelings about that because a lot of people, you know, if you're living in Skid Row, you're going to deal with a lot of severe depression, but are you mentally ill? Do you need to be termed mentally ill? So a lot of people end up coming in and getting on meds or coming to my clinic because that's what they require to uh, have their landlords uh, put them in as saying, yes, I'm receiving treatment, so therefore I'm getting housing, therefore I'm getting whatever it is I'm supposed to be getting. So on the one hand, we believe in recovery. That's one of the three uh, prime values of the Department of Mental Health. And on the other hand, there is the sense of enabling. When I get, I mean, I, I'm careful about who I write reports for to try to get them on Social Security. Uh, if I think they really cannot work and cannot take care of themselves, I do it, and I do it well and wholeheartedly. There's a lot I'm hesitant about because I don't want to create the sense that, no, you can't. Um, that's how, I, that's how, on an individual level, a lot of people are trying to get out. But what does society do, meaning the county, the city, and the federal uh, cops? Like I talked about, Twin Towers. Um, and there, I think a lot of it is about maintaining real estate value and containing Skid Row so that it is tiny. And you can keep your little Tokyo posh hotels and sushi restaurants. You can keep your industry to the east. You can keep downtown to the west. And you keep the nice, pretty, smelly flower district, good smelling flower district to the south. Um, just a little perspective, uh, if you walk around Hollywood with a cigarette and you tap your cigarette in front of a cop, are you going to get a ticket? No. No, we're not going to get a ticket. If you're a black male in Skid Row and all you're doing is smoking a cigarette and you tap 
your cigarette, a cop might give you a citation for what's called ashing. The ticket is $159. Now you live off of $221 a month. So just to put them, and you haven't eaten yet. So just to put that in perspective, if you're living off of $1,000 a month, you know, that ticket is like $700. And you're broke. So now you can't pay your ticket. So now, hopefully Homeless Court can help you out, but they're not going to adjudicate all these tickets. So now you didn't pay your ticket, so now there's a warrant for your arrest. Now you have to go to Twin Towers. Uh, a year of sending somebody to Twin Towers is about $70,000. You're probably going to get a 90-day sentence, so that's about $17,000, $18,000 of your tax dollars. Seventeen, eighteen thousand dollars could have put this guy in housing for four years, like easily. Where is our money going? It's going to futility. It's much easier for a mayor to say, "I'm really tough on crime and fuck poor people," and that's great, and you can vote for me, and at least I dumped six million dollars to get police to harass these poor people. God forbid you say I put six million dollars into housing. Uh, dollar for dollar, the cheapest, most effective way to uh, help people. And I'm not talking about compassion here. I'm talking about heartless republicanism. How do I save money policy-wise? <coughs> Cheapest way is therapy. Cheapest way. Uh, Low-income housing is better than having people be homeless. Uh, average chronically uh, homeless person in Skid Row, keeping in mind that's half of the roughly 10,000 people there, costs something like $70,000 a year due to frequent emergency room visits. Some of it's drugs, but a lot of it is just diabetes, appendicitis, what have you. If you can give these people some preventative care, it's a lot cheaper. Everything you, you know, it's like what Ben Franklin said, right? Uh, what is it, a, a penny? Save is a penny. No, no, there's another thing, like, like if you put a penny <laughs> in, you save a lot of pennies. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of yes! cure. Yes, 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 an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Thank you. But we don't really have that with poor people because poor people don't deserve this. I mean, we have lots of money for, you know, like bombs, right? We, we spend, we have more people in our prisons within the United States than in the whole world combined. We have more money spent on our, our military than the whole world combined. Yeah, but we don't have money for this. So one of the points of emphasis I wanted to take out from here as a policy level is uh, it's a lot cheaper to care and it's a lot cheaper to help than it is to disengage and say that's what <laughs> poor smelly people do. They're fucked up, they're crazy, their neighborhoods smell like shit and I don't want to deal with them and I don't want to spend on them. If this is just about saving money you're going to invest in low-income housing. You're going to have therapists. How much do I cost an hour for the county? Not that much. And therapists, meds, group therapy, socialization, a little bit of compassion would help. The other day, you know, I mean, at least once a week, someone comes to my clinic suicidal. And that's the good news, because that at least means he came to the clinic and said I'm suicidal, as opposed to somebody just killed himself. And they get strapped into the gurney. And a lot of times the, the case manager or therapist who works with them just kind of ignores them because they're so depressed they don't speak. So they'll get out their paperwork and just, you know, catch up. I'm wondering why we don't things like give them a flower when they're going off to be mentally hospitalized or a smile or something, you know, relatively inexpensive that demonstrates compassion. Uh, I think Skid Row is a big deal, partly because it's, for me, it's the most real humane place that I've found in my life as far as cities go. And uh, I often think, I mean, I'm not Christian per se, so when I say Jesus, you don't have to take on the New Testament belief system, but I'm thinking if Jesus came back nowadays to L.A., I mean, I don't think he would open up a beautiful healing center in West L.A. where, you know, white people could say, oh, my God, it was, like, the best, and my aura is, like, totally... <laughs> no, I mean, he would be in Skid Row. You know, he'd be barefoot, and he'd be preaching the word there. So uh, I would, if you want, you can consider... Uh, is my time up, Shane? Or five? Nice. Uh, I would urge you to go there during the daytime. It's very safe. It's very, very safe. Uh, at nighttime, it's not safe. Um, I was late for one of my interview there, and I got the wrong address. I remember wearing like a three-piece suit and like sprinting through Skid Row with a panic look on my face. And several people there tried to stop me because they felt bad for me, going, "You okay, man?" <laughs> you know, it's, it's a community. It's, it's a community, and it's real. Uh, other things that are helpful. Not everybody uses these, but for example, this is uh, black tourmaline. I think a dollar or two. It's a good grounding stone. Uh, it helps people center. Uh, I give a lot of my patients uh, rose quartz. A piece this big is about a dollar. You can get it at the farmer's market in the valley or any rock shops. Uh, this diminishes anxiety, diminishes depression. My patients who have severe anger issues, I give them carnelian or agate. Patients who have very low self-esteem will get rose quartz for self-love. Patients who have such severe anxiety, they're physically shaking, I give them hematite or tourmaline. It's very, very cheap, and it reduces symptoms. By comparison, a bottle of Abilify or Seroquel can be about $500 a month. 
and they're going to be on that the rest of their lives. So you do the math. Um, caring about people, treating people like they're normal, engaging with people, that's the most important thing there. There's a tremendous amount of compassion to be found going into and out of Skid Row. And I feel that it's uh, kind of like the dirty little secret that everyone knows about and no one really wants to deal with in Los Angeles. Uh, I also think it's amazing that there's so much good that can be done there. Uh, I also wanted to know maybe if there's just one or two questions, because I probably have one or two minutes left. I have one. Yeah? So I um, am the only non-Republican member of my family. I have a very hard time getting the idea of compassion and empathy across the Without them seeing this firsthand or, or, or feeling like they're walking in a person's shoes, how would you recommend people get across that kind of I think that, that I mean, the, the question is, if I can summarize, the, the question is how can someone uh, get their Republican family to see that uh, people in Skid Row are human beings deserve meriting the same kind of care and compassion that other Republicans give to each other all the time? Uh, I mean, that's a, <laughs> that, it, that's a process. I mean, one, one thing I would say is... Uh, I guess for me, the question is, you know, when at some point all everyone here is going to die, and we're going to look back on our lives. So I pretend like I'm 80 and I'm dying, and I'm looking back on my life, and I just say, well, what does he wish I did? And that's kind of how I live. Whether bless you, whether it's being nervous about asking a girl out on a date, or whether it's do I want, you know, to take this trip or not, or what career choice will I do? What does the old man in me wish I did? So, you know, ask them when they're old, and George Bush the third is president. <laughs> You know, oh no, he was the third. Before. No, he was the second. The sec when George Bush the third is president, which <laughs> we talked about Skid Row for like thirty minutes, but one George Bush reference. <laughs> It's a high note. It's a high note. So I, I, I guess I would say just ask them to kind of look into themselves. And uh, I wanted to thank everyone again. And um, if you want to talk more about Skid Row or whatever else, you know, I'll be around at lunch. So thank you very much, everyone.